you so much. Another capacity crowd, I think, for Barnes Philosophy Club. Um, so very excited to have you all here. Who's here for the first time and has no idea what they have let themselves in for? Only a few. Okay, well, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, I'm Nick Aldridge, and I've been uh, chairing the club for a few years now. We are a public club uh, that meets to talk with philosophers and discuss a wide variety of philosophy. We do occasionally have uh, non-philosophers speaking as well. Our last one was an AI scientist, and we've had stand-up comedians, but we focus on philosophers. Um, and the idea is just to... You know, learn a little bit about some of the, the current thinking uh, in philosophy and have a bit of discussion. Uh, we'll have uh, around about 40 minutes of talk uh, from, from Jesse here, and then we'll open it up uh, and take questions from the audience. And if you're on Zoom, moment to remember to turn off your camera if you wish, we can't do that, and to put yourselves on mute, uh, which we can do. Uh, we're supported by the Royal Institute of Philosophy and also by uh, the OSO, the theatre here, and that allows us to keep meetings free of charge for everyone. Uh, if you would like to support the club, uh, you can donate when you book a ticket, as I think a growing number of you are managing to do. So thank you, everyone who's done that. And as a reward, or some would say penalty uh, for doing that, uh, you're entitled to a copy of our book, What Counts as Philosophy? So if you don't already have uh, a copy of that, uh, come see me afterwards and we'll, we'll give you uh, one of those. Um, we are going to attempt to record uh, for our virtual audience. Robin's looking characteristically confident. Okay, I'll make of that what you will. Um, so bear that in mind, particularly those of you on Zoom. Uh, and you can put things in the chat and Robin tries to keep an eye on that. So I'm hoping the sound is good for you all on Zoom. If not, please let us know in the chat and we will attempt to sort that out. Um, for those of you here in person, please feel for a drink or even two afterwards in the Oso bar. Jesse will have to dash off to get a train shortly after nine. Um, so you may not have time to, to buy Jesse a drink, but we will have time to say thank you at the end. Um, and let me yeah, introduce uh, Jesse Munton. Uh, Jesse is an associate professor in philosophy at Cambridge and a fellow and director of studies for philosophy at St. John's. Um, Jesse's become increasingly interested in negative epistemology. So that's how we evaluate ignorance, forgetting the failure to undertake inquiry uh, or collect evidence. Uh, and recently, uh, Jesse won the Philip Leverhulme Prize and is going to use the funds to spend time thinking about forgetting. <laughs> Not forgetting about thinking. Yeah. Um, so those of you who closely follow our theme for the season, and I know you all do and remember exactly what it is, uh, it is philosophy and modern life, it says here. Um, so... We thought it'd be very interesting to hear from uh, Jessie on one of her areas of specialism, which is the philosophy of prejudice. Uh, what does it take to be prejudiced against a particular group? And is prejudice always uh, epistemically problematic? Is it always damaging for knowledge and how knowledge comes about? Or are there innocent forms of prejudice, uh, epistemically speaking? And Jesse's going to argue that certain important forms of prejudice do not require the presence of any cognitive or emotive attitude, nor need they manifest in behaviour. Uh, they can just be constituted by the organisation of information. So we're going to hand over to Jesse to talk to us about that uh, until about 20 past. And at that point, we will then open it up for discussion. So thank you very much, Jesse, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, so today, I really want to dig into this question, which is, what does it take to be prejudiced against a particular group? Um, but in the background of that question, there's a sort of 
host of other even bigger questions. So one which I'm particularly interested in is whether prejudice is inherently epistemically valenced or not. I'm just going to see if I can make this smaller so that I can see all of the text in my slides as I go. OK, that's better. So I'm going to be using this term epistemic or epistemology quite a lot, so I thought it might be helpful just to unpack what it means. So there's lots of ways in which we evaluate one another. So suppose you've got a friend who likes to kick cats, even though cats have never done anything to him. You're probably going to evaluate him from a moral standpoint as not great. So you might say that's a morally bad thing to do, to kick innocent cats. But there's other perspectives too from which you can evaluate your friend. And the one I'm particularly interested in, which I call kind of epistemic, is thinking about your friend as somebody who kind of processes and responds to information. So your friend might be horrible to cats, but he might be extremely intelligent. He might be sort of a perfect epistemic agent, even though he's not kind. So when I'm talking about epistemic evaluation, I'm talking about evaluating how people reason, how they think, how they manage information that's in their environment. So actually, I think this is a kind of evaluation that we engage in all the time when we call people stupid or ignorant or something like that. We're saying that you're not processing information in the way in which I kind of approve of or recommend. So one question that I'm interested in in relation to prejudice is, does it always involve processing information in suboptimal ways? Or could you be absolutely perfect from the point of view of epistemic evaluation, but still prejudiced in some way or other? And in the background of that question is this kind of meta philosophical question, which is, what are the limits on epistemic evaluation? So contemporary philosophy has focused on particular ways of approaching epistemology, particular ways of thinking about ourselves as things that respond to information. Um, but how far can we push that? And where does the border lie between moral evaluation and epistemic evaluation? So here are my kind of argumentative goals for the next 40 or 45 minutes or so. Here's my main one. I want to suggest that certain patterns of attention can be sufficient for a minimal form of prejudice. So I'll just say a bit what I mean by attention, and we're going to get into this in more detail later. So you attend to information when you focus on it in some way so that you can use it for some particular task or other. So that use might be very diffuse or kind of minimal, but suppose that you're sitting in a cafe and you're talking to your friend, but you can, if you want, sort of zone out of your conversation with your friend and instead zone into the other conversation that's happening at a table near you. So when you do that, you're sort of shifting the focus of your attention from your friend's conversation to the other conversation and then you can move it back again. So that's what I mean by attention. I also want to argue that we can fruitfully describe those patterns of attention, the kinds of patterns of attention which can be sufficient for a minimal form of prejudice, um, in terms of salient structures. And that's part of a kind of bigger project that I'll say a bit about, we probably won't get into all the nuts and bolts of. Um, and then I'm also going to suggest that we can epistemically evaluate salient structures, and that might be a quite big upheaval in how we're thinking about epistemology. So this is how we're going to get there today. First of all, I'm going to say a bit more about the philosophical background to this question of what does it take to be prejudiced and different approaches that people have taken to that question. Then I'm going to talk a bit more about salience and attention and introduce you to the ways in which um, I want to use those concepts so that I can then build an account of prejudice in terms of salience and attention, in particular in terms of the misattribution of salience. So when you're attending to features, maybe you don't need to be attending to. And then I'll say something about how I think we can epistemically evaluate what's going on in those situations. And then finally, kind of very briefly, if we have time, I'll say a little bit about some of the wider applications of this, maybe in particular in relation to modern life. Um, OK, so let me start by saying a bit about how philosophers have thought about this question of what it takes to be prejudiced. So this is Michelle Moody Adams, who's a professor at Columbia University, uh, and she has an account of prejudice which is rooted in beliefs. So one way of approaching this question, right, well, what makes you prejudiced is that you have a particular cognitive attitude, a belief of some kind, about the group against whom you're prejudiced, and moreover, that's likely to be a, a negative conception of that group, a negative belief about the group in question. So according to Moody Adams, prejudice is a particular sort of cognitive attitude. She has this nice phrase that it's a distinctive conception of the nature of reality. So it kind of represents the world as being some way. So if you're prejudiced against women, you might represent women as less good in some respect or other. Now, some people couple that with uh, the specification that that has to involve an epistemic flaw of some kind. So it might only count as prejudice if not only do you have a negatively valence belief of some kind, 
But in addition, it's inaccurate or you've arrived at that belief in a way that's irrational. So you're not responding properly to the evidence that you have at your disposal, for instance, you're jumping to a conclusion, perhaps. So that's a very powerful account of lots of forms of prejudice. So I should say that in sort of offering you the account I'm gonna offer, this is to sort of supplement the resources that are on the table. I'm not trying to shove these resources off the table. So first ingredient, maybe we want it to involve some kind of belief-like state of some kind. But you might think it involves a bit more than that, that it's not just a representation of reality, that prejudice also involves feeling of some kind, perhaps like a feeling of dislike or disgust or something in that neck of the woods. So this is Jorge Garcia, and he's argued that racism in particular requires individual ill will on the part of the person who is prejudiced. It's not just that you have a belief, not even just that you have a negatively valent belief, or maybe an inaccurate belief, but there's also this kind of commitment of um, the will in some way that you dislike or think less of the group in person. He describes it as a vicious kind of racially based disregard for the welfare of certain people. And some people add, in addition, the condition that this is moralized. I, I just realized I have a handout. Oh, yeah. I just wonder if it would be helpful for people to have it so that they can. I think it would. I'll get on to that. Okay, so okay, well, I'll keep going. Um, yeah, so some people add, in addition, the requirement that racism always involves a moral vice of some kind or else. You don't count as racist if um, you're morally innocent or inevitably it comes along with that. Okay, so now we've got ingredients on the table. We've got something that's kind of belief-like. We've got the possibility it involves a feeling of some kind. And then a third criterion that's sometimes on the table is that you also have to act on the basis of it in a particular way. So this is a behavioral criterion. So this is Anne Cudd and, oops, wrong way. Um, so Cudd and Jones have an account of what it takes to be sexist. And they think that sexism requires oppression of women. So it's not just to do with the beliefs you have or the feelings you have, but in addition, you have to behave in a particular way. So um, similarly, other people have offered accounts of racism that incorporate this. So Anthony Appiah has suggested that racism requires acting towards people of another race in a way that manifests that negative belief or that has discriminatory consequences. And Corlett has suggested that you have to engage in ethnic discrimination of some kind. Okay. Before we go any further, I just want to introduce a kind of another strand that's in this debate, perhaps in the background. So the first criterion I said I was interested in involves something that's a bit like a belief. And there's a lot of controversy in philosophy around what exactly a belief is. And that becomes particularly vexed and contentious when we are in the area of trying to understand prejudice or bias. So almost anybody who has a job will have to have done implicit bias training of some kind. Um, and that's a kind of body of work that starts from what's now quite widely accepted, which is that in addition to having explicit beliefs, you might have implicit beliefs, which you can't consciously access, but which reveal themselves in your behavior in certain ways. So this is a picture of Mazreen Banaji, who's a professor at Harvard, who did some of sort of early groundbreaking work in trying to test and detect implicit biases of certain kinds. So these are supposed to be attitudes which individuals have, but which they can't sort of consciously access in a way to report on them, but that are revealed nonetheless through how they conduct themselves. So when we're asking whether prejudice always involves beliefs or what kinds of beliefs it involves, there's a number of questions in this area. So it might be that it involves explicit beliefs, but perhaps it can also just rely on implicit, we could call them beliefs, we could be a bit more broad church and just call them attitudes of some kind, which the subject can't access explicitly. So suppose that it does rely on these implicit attitudes, it seems like quite well grounded, though it's not an uncontentious body of research there. Um, then there's a further question which arises, which is, what is the nature of those implicit attitudes? And in particular, how are we to understand their relationship with explicit attitudes? So one metaphor, which I think is, nobody uses it, but maybe it reflects a way in which you might think about it, is almost like um, they're like normal beliefs, but they're sort of underwater in some sense. So the ones that are above water, you can see and access and report on, and then implicit attitudes would be basically structurally the same things, but just a bit less accessible. Um, but that they still involve mental representations in one kind or another. And part of the reason I'm introducing this is because the way in which I'm thinking about prejudice might also give us a different way of thinking about implicit attitudes. Okay, so that's been like a kind of whistle-stop tour of some of the existing philosophical approaches to thinking about what 
prejudice is. And the approach that I want to suggest to you this evening departs from these. And one way of characterizing it would be to say, not so much that prejudice has to involve a belief or a pattern of behavior or a particular feeling. Prejudice can kind of be in the filing cabinet in the sense that it can be constituted by how you organize the information that you have at your disposal and how you prioritize information, both that you've already encountered and that you haven't yet acquired, but in terms of kind of organizing your search for new information. So the idea is that prejudice can arise purely through the relative prioritization of information. So again, let me emphasize that um, sort of philosophers like to kind of isolate things in unrealistic ways. So this, this sort of prejudice that I'm interested in understanding better almost always is going to coexist with those other kinds of prejudice that I was talking about before, but it's still an important aspect of prejudice that we might want to understand better. So the idea is that information is organized by both an individual's mind and the broader social context that they operate in into something that I'm going to call a salient structure. And then I'm going to suggest that salient structures, which are unduly organized around demographic categories, are sufficient for a kind of minimal sort of prejudice. Even when, and this is where we're kind of supplementing the tools of traditional epistemology, even when the information which falls within that ordering is not itself inaccurate or unjustified. So you might be sort of ticking a lot of boxes by standard epistemic standards, but I'm going to say there's still ways in which you could be a non-ideal epistemic agent in virtue of how you're prioritizing the information which you have. Okay, so let me say a bit more about salience and attention because those are important concepts for me and I think they're just also quite interesting in their own right. So as a kind of way into understanding the account that I want to give, Maybe think about the attitude of parental love for a moment. So suppose that um, I don't know, Janet is the parent of this child that we have here. Janet's going to have a whole load of beliefs about her child. And some of those are positively valent, uh, nice positive beliefs about what a little angel she is. And some of them might be negatively valenced about how she can be trying or the difficulties that she's having with certain activities. Um, so Here's a sort of um, way of representing that. So you could think of each of the beliefs that Janet has about her child as a little isolated dot. It's obviously wildly unrealistic. We want to load more kind of structure among these dots. Um, and let's say that the dots that are colored blue are the more negatively valenced beliefs, and the dots that are colored red are the more positively valenced beliefs. And what I want to suggest is that part of what it is to love somebody, to love a child, is for the positively valenced beliefs to be just a bit more accessible than the negatively valenced ones. So it's not that you can't access the negatively valenced beliefs, but it's that if you're having a sort of casual chat or conversation about your child, the more positive ones just kind of pop to mind. They're the ones that you're readier to tell somebody about. Whereas if you consider what happens when you dislike somebody, a colleague who irritates you, for instance, then even though you can recognize that actually they are, for instance, very good at their job or on occasion they're very kind, the things which you dislike tend to just be more at the top of the pile in that way. So what I'm suggesting here is that how accessible certain beliefs or attitudes are can be partially constitutive of an attitude like love or dislike or irritation of some kind. And then I kind of want to go from there into using that as a way into understanding what might be going on in certain forms of prejudice. So we could say in the case of Janet that the positively valence beliefs are salient to Janet. And what I mean by salient is that they are disposed to attract her attention. But lots of things are disposed to attract your attention. So salience can be used in the context of perception to indicate something that's very low level that can be driven by bottom up factors like the contrast between different colors. So when you're looking at these dots here, the red dot is likely to be salient to you. It captures your attention just because it looks different to the other dots. So in virtue of the contrast between it and the other dots around it. But salience, what salient to you is also determined by much more complex top-down factors. So if you're walking along the road and you see two buskers with horses heads on, that's also likely to capture your attention, not in virtue of low level contrast necessarily, but just because it's a really unusual thing to see, the kind of thing which might demand explanation of some kind. Okay, 
So I first got interested in the notion of salience when I was reading about accounts of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, like delusions and hallucinations. And this is Shittaj Kapoor, and he has a quite influential theory uh, according to which those symptoms come about in response to what he calls aberrant salience. So his idea is that schizophrenia often involves the dysregulation of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And one of the things that dopamine does is it moderates what things are salient to you. So his thought is that when that's dysregulated, things which don't perhaps subjectively merit attention or which aren't in fact unusual might seem very salient to you. And then the positive symptoms of schizophrenia come about because you're trying to generate an explanation for why they seem so salient when actually there isn't a whole ton to go on there. So this is Shittaj Kapoor writing, he says the mesolimbic dopamine system is seen as a critical component in the attribution of salience, a process whereby events and thoughts come to grab attention, drive action and influence goal-directed behavior because of their association with reward and punishment. So that's what's going on in all of us all the time. And then he's interested in how when that process goes wrong, you might end up with something that looks like a delusion. According to him, delusions are a cognitive effort by the patient to make sense of these aberrantly salient experiences whereas hallucinations reflect a direct experience of the aberrant salience of internal representations. So what I was really struck by when I first came across Shittaj Kapoor's ideas was two things. So one is that if he's right about this as an account of what's going on in schizophrenia, then actually salience and its regulation by dopamine is critical to all of our reasoning, whether or not we have schizophrenia. The other thing is that he's using this evaluative term of salience. He's saying that salience can be aberrant. And so I was interested in trying to unpack what it would mean for salience to be aberrant. Why shouldn't something be salient to you? I don't think I've quite got to the bottom of that yet, um, but you'll see I've got some thoughts on it as we go. So on his theory, suppose that an individual's dopamine is dysregulated and they see a busker who is not wearing a horse's head, it's possible that you might have a strong experience of that being very salient to you, so it's capturing your attention in some way. And then that drives you to try to generate some kind of explanation for why it seems so salient to you. And that forms the basis of the delusion. So I had an experience recently where I bought myself some lightly salted, salted veggie tortilla chips from the co-op, which normally come in three flavors. But bizarrely, I ended up with a bag in which I only had red ones. Uh, so this is the kind of thing where how salient should that be to you? It kind of stuck with me in a slightly uncanny way. Uh, and so it's the kind of thing, this will become important later, that I generated some explanations for. So maybe they'd run out of the other flowers that day, or perhaps the machine had been malfunctioning in some way that meant they hadn't integrated the different sorts of tortilla chip. Um, but it's important that we have systems for figuring out which things like that really merit a lot of our attention and which things should we let go and let slide by us and not be the kind of thing that we perseverate on and focus on? OK, so I said already that salience guides attention in the sense that, as I'm using the term, something is salient if you're disposed to attend to it. And an important aspect of this is that salience and attention are competitive. So you can only attend to one thing if you're not attending to something else. So you can't just sort of attend to everything. And similarly, something is only salient at the expense of other things which are deprioritized. So this is a kind of competitive process. You're boosting some things up by suppressing other things. Um, and so that's absolutely crucial to our functioning in a very information rich environment that we have filters and systems in our minds that effectively prioritize the information that's going to be relevant to us for a given task and suppress or let go the information that's not going to be relevant for that particular task. Um, OK, so I've said a little bit about philosophical theories of prejudice. I've said a bit more about what I mean by attention and salience, and I've hinted at some of the roles that those things have in our minds. And now I want to put those together by offering an account of how some patterns of attention might be sufficient for prejudice. So I really want to do that by offering you three examples of the ways in which I think this might operate. So I'm kind of making up these cases, but I think they reflect um, scenarios that are not particularly unrealistic or they're kind of idealizations of things that you might encounter quite often in your everyday life. So I've got three different sorts of cases, which I've called selection, perseveration, and abduction. <laughs> 
So selection, perseveration is perhaps the simplest of these. Let's take somebody, I'm going to call her Margaret, who has quite a lot of knowledge, let's say, about Islam and the Muslim world. So for the sake of argument, let's suppose that most of Margaret's beliefs are accurate and justified. So maybe she's done quite a lot of reading on this. So she might know a lot about Islamic art and architecture and historical centers of learning in the Islamic world, their relationship with Western philosophy, for instance. But she also has beliefs in there which are less positively valent. So she knows about recent associations between uh, Islam and terrorism or the involvement of Muslim men in the sex scandal in Rotherham, let's say. Now, in addition to asking whether Margaret's beliefs are accurate or justified, we can ask another question, which is, which of those beliefs is Margaret focusing on? So I don't know if you've ever met people like this, but you know, we all have friends who have particular beliefs which really kind of loom large in their mental lives, the kinds of beliefs which they return to a lot, and which they kind of naturally focus and perseverate on. So I would suggest that Margaret can be prejudiced against Muslims if, even though her belief set may be accurate, even though it may be well justified, if she is attending disproportionately to the negatively valenced beliefs, then that's a kind of minimal form of prejudice. So in the same way that I was suggesting that in the case of parental love, your um, greater attention to those positively valenced beliefs is part of what it is to love your child. In Margaret's case, I would suggest that perseverating on negatively valenced beliefs about a particular group can be a kind of prejudice. Okay, here's the second sort of case I'm interested in, which is selecting information, selecting either evidence you don't yet have or selecting among the beliefs that you do have. So suppose that you're interested in film and you're flicking through a kind of encyclopedia of, of film, but for whatever reason, there might be a wide range of causes why this might happen, and we don't necessarily have to have answered all the questions about what those causes are. Um, for some reason, you only really attend to the entries about films by white directors or that involve white actors, and you just kind of skip past the entries that uh, pertain to films about black directors or that involve black actors. Here's another case that I think um, is kind of closer to home for me. So suppose that you're doing some philosophical research and you're on this very useful database, which is Phil Papers, something that a lot of my students use. You're searching for relevant readings on a particular topic, like why is there something rather than nothing. But as you go down the list, you just kind of uh, happen to not click any further on the papers which are by women. And instead you do click on the papers which are by men. They might have more familiar names, for instance, that kind of thing might make them more salient to you. And so then you go ahead and you do your research and you write your paper, but the bibliography exclusively contains references that are to works that are by men and neglects works on this topic, which are by women. Now, that might be a good piece of research, um, just as the person who's interested in film might end up knowing quite a lot about film, but it's a partial bit of research, just as their knowledge about film is partial in some sense. So I think, again, here what we have is a case where by systematically neglecting some subset of your information, you are in some way prejudiced against the group whose information you're deprioritizing. Now, the third kind of case I'm interested in might take a little bit longer to unpack because I need to introduce you to the idea of abductive inference, though I'm sure I know some of you are regular attenders and so this might be familiar, but I'll go over it again sort of just in case. So by abductive inference, I mean the kind of inference that Sherlock Holmes, for instance, engages in. So you have some particular piece of evidence, um, uh, like I don't know, a bloody hammer or something, uh, and then your job is to figure out what is the explanation for that piece of evidence. Or you have something mysterious that's occurred, and you're trying to figure out what the reason for that is or what the explanation behind that is. So abductive inference is a kind of ampliative inference in the sense that you are starting from something which on its own is not sufficient to absolutely determine the direction that your mind should go in. So in that respect, it's different from deductive inference, where sort of the argument compels you to endorse a particular conclusion. Um, so this is Jerry Foder's description of Sherlock Holmes performing some abductive inference, which is quite helpful for my purposes. He writes, Holmes didn't laboriously search through every single item in memory as he does this kind of figuring out what the reason for some particular bit of evidence is. To be effective, his abductive inference required the use of only a small subset of his beliefs. So one of the things that's interesting about Sherlock Holmes, I guess, is that he's particularly good at 
integrating lots of disparate bits of information which might seem irrelevant to the rest of us. But it's certainly true that often when we're performing abductive inference, there's a whole ton of information that's obviously irrelevant to a particular question. So for instance, if I'm trying to figure out why are all the crisps in my packet red, the fact that I ate a boiled egg for breakfast is not something that I want to be kind of popping up as the kind of thing that I might draw on in performing that abductive inference. That's not relevant to that particular problem. But information that I know about how people make crisps might be relevant to that kind of problem. OK, so back to Fodor. The paradox of this global form of abduction, then, is that on the one hand, in principle, the whole background of epistemic commitments should be somehow brought to bear in planning and belief fixation. While on the other hand, it's only feasible in real time to access only the relevant information. So I think what Fodor's getting at here is that it seems like to be good at abductive inference, ideally, you would run through every single piece of information at your disposal to figure out which ones are going to be relevant to the problem at hand. But of course, you don't actually have time to do that. So it's essential that you have this information in some magic way pre-sorted so that you can kind of pull out the stuff that's relevant and just deal with that. So I hope this is making you think, aha, kind of sounds like we're in the arena of attention and salience here, that we need mechanisms which are going to promote some information and let that kind of pop into your mind at the relevant moment and deprioritize the information that's not relevant for that particular task. So here are some stages of abductive inference. So one thing you need to do is you need to select the evidence that requires explanation. I think that's kind of what Shittage Kapoor is getting at, that um, sometimes we just have a feeling like something is freaky or unusual or surprising, and that's the kind of thing that we should focus our energies on when it comes to abductive inference. You then have to select a set of possible competing hypotheses. So with the crisps example, I was mentioning there's a hypothesis which is that they've run out of flour. There's another hypothesis that the machine is malfunctioning. I guess there's another hypothesis, which is that somebody in the crisp factory is trying to communicate with me through the provision of my crisps. Um, and then we need to select and weigh further evidence. So yeah, there's the evidence of the color of my crisps, but it, are there going to be other things which favor one explanation over another? So if I know that there's you know, shortages of particular colors of flour, for instance, that seems highly relevant to this. Um, if I've had like other odd signs coming to me through things I buy at the co-op, that might also seem like it's relevant. Then you have this process of calculating which of those competing hypotheses is best supported by the evidence. So the point I want to make is that abduction involves the selection of information through and through. And what conclusions you arrive at is going to depend on the ways in which you're selecting information. And one thing we kind of know by now is that when we're dealing with the selection of information, we're dealing with attention and salience. OK, so here are some ways in which I think abduction could result in something that looks like a kind of prejudice. So suppose that Derek, let's say, is an older man who is working with a younger colleague and the younger colleague is openly gay. And that's not something that Derek has often worked with in the past. The younger colleague is also quite aggressive and Derek finds her difficult to work with, let's say. And in trying to sort of figure out to himself, like, why is she so aggressive or why do I find her difficult to work with? Her sexuality just looms very large in his mind. So in terms of selecting hypotheses, that the fact that she is not straight is something that seems very relevant to him and is something through which he might then filter his search for further evidence. And it's something that he's going to weigh heavily in terms of understanding her behavior. So the risk then is that he arrives at something that looks like a prejudiced belief, which might be that she is aggressive because she's not straight, for instance. Um, but what's really going on here is something that's occurring at the point where Derek is selecting the evidence and the hypotheses as he attempts to understand the situation that he finds himself in. Here's another case. So let's say that Amy is a white woman who is working as a clinical psychologist and she's performing tests on a child who's black. She performs a whole battery of tests. And let's say, which is often the case, that the upshot of those tests is not particularly clear. There's a lot of ambiguity between the different measures that she's using. But suppose that the race of the child that she is testing is very salient to Amy, then there's the potential that that guides her um, interpretation of the evidence that she has at her disposal. And so Amy could arrive at that, through that, at the conclusion that the child has, let's say, for the sake of argument, ADHD. Now, Amy might be right about that, but I think we still have reason to be concerned if 
how she is prioritizing information is guided by the child's race in that way might look like something that we regard as a form of prejudice even if the particular conclusion she arrives at in this case is in fact true okay so i've sort of described three broad sorts of cases which were perseveration selection and induction and now i want to step back and say a little bit about what unifies these different cases so I've been sort of suggesting that they all involve a form of prejudice. You don't have to think this is the most egregious form of prejudice, but it's something that certainly resembles other things we recognize as prejudice. But the beliefs involved may be rational and accurate. Now, in the case of abduction, we have a lot more room to appeal to normal tools of epistemic evaluation because there, in virtue of its ampliative nature, the people who are engaged in abduction are adding to their belief set in ways that we sometimes will involve arriving at beliefs which are inaccurate or unjustified. But perseveration and selection don't have those aspects to them. In fact, in those cases, there need be no change in the individual's belief set in the sense of new beliefs that are added or old beliefs that are lost. Rather, in the case of um, Margaret perseverating on a certain subset of beliefs about Muslims, um, you could think that her belief set is kind of staying stable and what we've got is a form of activity within a belief set that seems like it's epistemically valuable. It's also important to note that what's problematic about some of these cases isn't the beliefs that individuals are forming, it's the beliefs that they're not forming. So in the selection cases, one of the things that's going on is that a certain body of evidence or a certain set of information, which seems kind of intuitively relevant to a question that the individual is involved in pursuing, is neglected. And so they're not forming beliefs, for instance, about films which are directed by black directors or philosophy papers which are written by women. So it seems like the problem lies in the subject's selection of or attention to certain information. So uh, this may be getting a bit baroque, so I won't spend too much on it. But one direction you might go in is you might think, oh, the problem is patterns of attention. It's attending to race or it's attending to gender that's the problem. And I think that that's in the right ballpark, but it's not exactly what we need. So um, the claim would be something like prejudicial attitudes can be constituted by inappropriate attention to demographic features. I think we're going to need more nuance in our account than this can offer, and I'll briefly say why. The key thing is just pinning down like what counts as inappropriate attention to demographic features, and that's going to be a question that still pops up for the account that I'll offer. But one thing to note is that there's just a lot of variety here in the kinds of patterns of attention that seem like they might be prejudiced in some way or other. So note that it can be attention to positive as well as negative properties that's problematic. So um, I was looking for a picture of a pregnant woman for a slide when I was teaching. And this is, at the time I did this, all of the images which came up in like the initial thing that Google offered me. And a thing which I think is really noticeable about them is that none of them involve a representation of the woman's face or head. So they're all focused on the bump. Now, I think that's a problem. It doesn't have to be a problem because it's not good to have a bump. You might think like, oh, pregnancy bumps are actually beautiful. Like, what's a, what's a lovely aspect of, of growing a baby? Um, but again, we have this kind of competitive aspect to attention, which means that by focusing on the bump, these photos are not also focusing on the head. I mean, the competition there's a little bit artificial because you could just extend the frame a teeny tiny bit and actually include their face or head. Um, but the key point to note here is that there might be some forms of attention which are problematic, even though they're not attention to negative properties. So if you have a colleague who's pregnant, you don't want all your attention to be devoted to the pregnancy, even if you think that's marvelous, because if you're attending to the pregnancy, you're not going to be attending to other more work relevant aspects of their behavior or performance. Another thing to notice is that absence or lack of attention is really key. So we don't just want to evaluate what you are attending to, we want to be thinking about what you're not attending to. So this is linking up with what Nick said in his introduction about how I have this interesting kind of negative epistemology. I think it very much comes up in the field of attention that we need to be able to think about lacuna in what in your attentional field in that regard. And then a final reason why we might not want to settle with that kind of first pass account I gave you is that in some cases, the features that you're attending to aren't themselves demographic. So this is what's going on in the case of like Amy, the educational psychologist, like 
race is very salient to her, but then that's directing her attention sort of downstream to certain test results rather than other test results. So in that case, the problem is more like that attention is organized around demographic categories rather than what we're worried about is attention to demographic features. Okay, so I think that what we really want is to evaluate attentional disposition. So a disposition in the sense of what are you likely to attend to, but we, we need some way of modeling that that's gonna capture what you're disposed to not attend to, as well as what you are disposed to attend to. Um, and th there's a lot more stuff I could say about sort of ignorance and how certain forms of ignorance seem kind of very resilient. And that's something that we might want to capture in our models. Okay, so I want you to introduce you to the idea of a salient structure, but I don't want us to get too bogged down in it. So I hope I'll say enough that kind of gives you something to be getting on with, but I'm very happy to answer more questions about it. So I want you to sort of imagine that you are, well, not really imagine, because this just is how it is, I think. You're located within an informational landscape, which is composed of all the possible, the uncountably many things that you could be attending to right now. So some of those are going to be internal to your mind, the kinds of things that nobody else but you can access. So maybe you might be attending to you know, an embarrassing memory from when you were 15 that persists in just popping into your mind at inadvertent moments. Or it might be that you're likely to be thinking about what you're going to be having for tea or whether you've left the cooker on. But it can also be things in your external environment. So it might be uh, the bright colours on the screen or my face. So salient structures comprise all of these possible objects of attention, which I call the tenderbelia. Then the idea is that we could kind of model how salient these things are to you in the sense of how likely is it that you would attend to them at any given moment. Now, there are so many attendability that we couldn't ever really actually do this in a realistic model. But if we did, we might end up with something that was a bit like this, I think very beautiful picture of the internet um, from the Opte project. So they have various ways of doing kind of visualizations of the internet, uh, which you can spend some pleasant time looking through. So what you have here are a representation of sort of um, web pages and the little yellow lines and links between those web pages. And the brightness reflects uh, the amount of traffic that you have going along those. So similarly, you could think, you know, there's some things in your mind which you attend to a lot, and there's other things which you're less inclined to attend to. And so if we had a kind of model of your mind and all the things in it that you're supposed to attend to, some things would be like, you know, uh, these things kind of at the periphery of your attention and other things would be kind of really central, things that you root through a lot in one way or another. Um, so the idea is that salient structures are a set of dispositions to attend and taken together, they determine the relative accessibility of information to a subject. So that's kind of what this ends up representing with the internet is like, how likely is somebody to pass through a particular web page? These very bright, very central ones, really quite likely much less likely to attend over there. And so in that sense, these web pages are more accessible just in the case that we're reflecting a kind of brute probability that they would be accessed. And salient structures do something similar. They're just reflecting a brute kind of probability that you would attend. So a salient structure can have lots of different causes and it's kind of collapsing over all sorts of different causes. So some of those are gonna be internal to your mind. Some of them are just going to be external. They're going to depend on the particular kind of environment that you're in. So you can't attend visually to something if it isn't in your visual field. So automatically, you know, what kind of a physical environment you're in is going to place significant constraints on what kinds of things you can attend to. What you attend to is often driven by valence and emotion. So we're all more inclined to focus on things that either maybe make us feel quite good or make us feel quite anxious. So if you've got an upcoming visit to the dentist or if you're worried about something financial, that's the kind of thing that's more likely to capture your attention. Um, and a lot of this stuff is just kind of passively acquired and shaped by your social structure in some ways, perhaps through repeated exposure and association or by social reward and punishment. So if you think of kids at school, there can be kind of social costs to not <coughs> anticipating what other people are going to attend to. So one of my sons dresses in very bold and brilliant ways and is not very sensitive to uh, kind of gender norms around particular clothes. And unfortunately, there are certain social costs associated with his failure to anticipate what's going to be salient about his outfits to other people in that way. And that's one of the ways in which our salient structures are shaped by the particular social context that we're in. Okay, so that's a basic idea of a salient structure. How do we then apply this to prejudice? 
to make sense of prejudice. So I want to suggest that a salient structure can constitute a prejudicial attitude towards a particular group when it's organised around that category. And there's a lot to say, and I won't say all of it, about sort of how do we understand organisation around a category. I think of it a little bit the way of like the way in which a landscape can be organised around a particular feature. So you've got a large mountain like Helvellyn, that's going to explain why, for instance, you get lakes in the particular areas you do, or why you have roads in the places that you do, or why people would take a particular route through that. So similar to the idea is your sort of salient structures organised around particular categories when they have a significant explanatory role to play. And then the idea would be that too much attention or negative attention can be driven by a salient structure, which renders other relevant or positive information less salient and vice versa. OK, so what we end up with is a kind of quite minimal form of prejudice. So it's going to coexist with and interact in complicated ways with the other ways of understanding prejudice that I started off with. But I want to say a little bit about the scope it gives us to understand implicit attitudes or what they really are. So on my account, you don't need to have a particular animus against a group to be prejudiced against them. You don't particularly need to hold explicit or implicit beliefs. You don't need to be capable of consciously accessing or endorsing a particular attitude. Um, instead, it's just that the information that you have is organized and prioritized in a particular way. So do you remember I said earlier on that one way of sort of thinking of implicit attitudes is they're just the same as explicit attitudes, but they're kind of under the water. So the way I'm thinking about prejudice offers us another way into understanding some forms of implicit attitude, which is maybe they're not just the same thing, but under the water. Maybe they're partly constituted by that organisation. So I'll just say a little bit more um, about that. I think I'm doing OK for time. Yep. yep. OK. A couple of minutes. What's that? Sounds good. Um, so this is a map which shows uh, how accessible certain locations are in London from a particular uh, place in the centre of London, basically. So red places are easier to access, and then the blue ones are a bit less hard to access. So this is, I think, uh, helpful maybe as a way of thinking about salient structures, because a map like this is going to aggregate information from lots of different sources and lots and lots of different causes. So lots of um, different factors will contribute to making one area more or less accessible than another. But it can be really valuable to put it together like this, because there's going to be certain factors that emerge at the level of the kind of topology of that kind of network of information as a whole that aren't visible if you're just focusing on individual isolated facts. Yeah. So my thought is that some kinds of implicit attitudes are similar in the sense that they emerge kind of at the level of facts about the topology as a whole. So if you remember before that kind of map I showed you of the internet, some of those very central nodes which are getting a lot of activity, you could think of them as hubs in some ways. So you could have prejudicial attitudes which are like explicit beliefs about a particular group which also function as hubs. And so um, part of what matters about that kind of prejudice is not just that you have that content, but also that it's playing that particular role in your mind. But you could have other kinds of implicit attitudes where maybe the content of the belief itself isn't explicitly negative. It's just the fact that it's playing that role, functioning a bit like a kind of hub in your network um, that means that it counts as a certain form of implicit prejudice. Similarly, it might not actually be that you know, there's one identifiable or a set of identifiable beliefs with explicit content, but rather that the whole of your salient structure is just organized around demographic factors in this way. Okay, so I'm gonna move on just before I finish to say briefly a few things about what might be wrong with a prejudicial salient structure. One concern we might have here is like, of course, all of our salient structures are organized around demographic factors. These are such fundamental aspects of people and how we interact with them and how we organize our societies that, in some sense, it's inevitable that we all have prejudicial salient structures. So that makes particularly urgent that we can understand both like, is there anything wrong here from an epistemic perspective? And if so, like, what does it take for it to be epistemically concerning? Is this always a concerning feature of our salient structures? Or is it only concerning in certain cases? So like I said at the beginning, there's different ways of approaching this question of what's wrong with something. So when we're thinking about prejudicial salient structures, one question we might ask is, um, 
whether they're problematic relative to certain practical goals. Um, so you might think actually that having a prejudicial salient structure, particularly if you live in a racist or a sexist society, is quite important for certain practical goals. Um, certainly some people seem to be able to kind of manipulate our disposition to organize information along demographic lines to their own advantage. So Donald Trump, for instance, stirring up particular anxieties around immigration plays to the fact that we have this disposition to organize our salient structures in this way. So I think there are practical benefits. I think there are practical problems to this kind of organization. I'm not going to get into them. Similarly, I'm not really going to talk about the moral consequences. I'm interested in evaluating them in epistemic terms. So are there epistemic costs to having prejudicial salient structures? Now, here, I think we face some difficulties with applying standard epistemic measures. So at the risk of caricature, standard epistemic measures ask, for instance, whether a belief is accurate or whether it's justified. And those are questions that we can only really ask of something that is truth apt. So something that can be true or false, like a statement of some kind. But salient structures aren't truth apt. You can't sort of say if a salient structure is true or false. It doesn't purport to represent things in any real way. And so all of those standard tools of epistemology are going to struggle to apply in these cases. Salient structures are also built around negative space. And lots of the tools of standard epistemology only apply to positive epistemic states. If you have a belief state, for instance, then we've kind of got something that we can ask whether or not it has certain properties. But if I'm sort of right that sometimes what matters is that you don't have a certain body of evidence or that you aren't forming certain belief states, then we're going to struggle to evaluate those things with the standard tools of epistemology. So I don't have very long, and so I'm going to be really brief here. But I think we can think about this in the same way that we might think about evaluating other things that regulate our access to goods, like transport networks and like websites, for instance. So our faculty website is absolutely infuriating. It's extremely difficult to find what you want on it. Um, and similarly, you know, we all evaluate transport networks fairly comfortably. You could say, you know, um, you could compare the merits of the Rome Metro, for instance, and the London Underground. So what are we doing when we do that? I think there's two things that we want, both from transport networks and from salient structures and probably also from websites. We want task relevant information. So you want to get to the place you need to get to. And we also want flexibility. So you don't just want to be able to do one journey repeatedly. What, depending on how your aims and objectives shift, you want your transport network to help you realize a whole load of different ends flexibly. So this might be one way in which you think the Rome Metro is a bit less good than the London Underground. There's some journeys you can accomplish very quickly on the Rome Metro, but if you want to get from the end of, for instance, this line to the end of that line, you're gonna to have to go all the way into the center and out again. So my suggestion is that prejudicial salient structures are problematic because they can involve this kind of calcification of information around a demographic category, which means that when that isn't relevant to the particular task that you're undertaking, it makes it harder to access other information that is relevant in those cases in virtue of what I said before about the competitive nature of salience. And so they can end up impeding the flexible provision of task relevant information. I'm going to skip a point I was going to make about Wordle. Um, so the basic idea would be, you know, I guess I grew up with these kinds of magazines that very explicitly encourage you to attend to women's cellulite. Um, that might seem incidental or trivial, but the worry is that then that kind of becomes a calcified aspect of your salient structure that means that's information that's always readily accessible to you, even when it's completely task irrelevant. I was going to say a bit about further applications, but I think I should probably stop at this point and we should do the question and answer. Does that seem Yes, we open it up. Yeah, yeah let's do that. Good. And maybe some of these further applications will come in at that point. Um, but thanks very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Justin. I'm going to hand the microphone to Graham. Um, I do have a lot of questions, but before I ask any, how many in the audience have something they'd like to ask or say? Uh, we do have a few, Graham. You keep me on. You have to go live. Well, I think maybe let's go straight to the audience. And if we can keep it fairly brief, we'll get through as many as we possibly can. So, Graham, if you start on the, the left, and you let, we've yep. got one over here. 
then we can go behind, and then who's who else? Right, okay, you're in a neat line, that's easy. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Jesse, for a very interesting talk. Um, do you think it's possible to identify uh, natural implicit biases simply because people belong to a certain culture? Or perhaps by just being human, our attitudes towards the natural world and certain biases which are quite natural because of human, although we may have to do over research biases. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm sure we've got innate dispositions towards a wide set of biases. I think, um, for instance, in group biases seem very prevalent and very easy to induce in certain ways. One of the things I'm interested in is the ways in which different social contexts can encourage or exacerbate those to different degrees, I guess. I think you're absolutely, I think it's important to recognize that that's something that we're, you know, always living with and managing in some way or other. And then we can ask the question, well, what kind of social structure or social setup lets us manage that in the best way we can? And what kind of aspects of social organization are perhaps um, pandering to or exploiting our inclination towards certain innate biases. Thank you. So I said pass the microphone back to Rose. Uh, it should be on, just talk straight into it. Um, <laughs> um, the person for absolute clarity, can you give your, your definition of the word prejudice? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't think I'm in the business of providing a definition. So my claim is that there is a form of prejudice which is constituted by, by the uh, organisation of salience around demographic categories. Why not define it? And how can you become it? So I guess I take it to be um, part of offering a definition that you're offering a comprehensive and exhaustive characterization of how a term can appropriately be used. So I think prejudice is a incredibly complex and multifaceted phenomenon. I think philosophers are too often inclined to want to announce that they've arrived at something like a definitive definition of a phenomenon that means that conversation can cease after that. Mm -hmm. And I think in the case of prejudice, that would be sort of wild the way of approaching it. So therefore, would you discount an Oxford dictionary definition? I think they're in the business of something different, which is maybe accounting for how we use terms or how we use language. And I think I see myself as trying to understand the underlying phenomenon underneath our language use, which might be highly diverse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, over to Kenneth, just uh, behind you. Yeah. Uh, great talk and very uh, compelling set of ideas. Um, let, let me try and say what I think you said, you can say if this is correct. So we all uh, pay attention to different facts in different contexts. Uh, for example, the sort of thing that we would say to one person is something different than what we would say to another person. So the facts that we should pay attention to in a different context depends on the context. And by having a flexible uh, attention structure, we're able to context switch uh, quickly and appropriately. So we're not, in a sense, offending people by saying the wrong thing to the wrong person. Is that essentially what you're saying? So, so um, yeah, that's really helpful. So I think I was absolutely on board with it. Um, maybe I think my concern isn't with us offending people. It's with us sort of operating successfully in the world. So causing offence might be part of that. But I guess the idea, you're exactly right, that like, my thought is that these salient structures are kind of highly context sensitive, right? So depending on what your task is, your salient structure is going to change. Or So, you know, if you can imagine your salient structure, imagine yourself getting hungrier and hungrier. Like food is going to loom larger and larger and be more and more likely to kind of capture your attention. So ideally, as you confront a different task, you can kind of refashion your salient structure. Like, okay, now I'm thinking about this topic, now I'm thinking about that topic, now I'm engaging with my auntie Marge, and this time I'm talking to a kid. You know, you know, different information you want to be at the top of the pile. 
So my concern is that there are going to be, you know, all sorts of aspects, not just prejudice, that kind of lock our salient structures into certain patterns that are then hard to escape from. So um, one of my sons is like a, a mad football fan at the moment. And so like, it doesn't matter what you ask him, the answer almost always has something to do with football. Or like football's always at the top of his pile. And in a way that's like harmless enough, but there are probably are ways in which it's stopping him from accessing other information that might be relevant or you know helpful to him in certain ways. So it might make you less good at solving certain problems. So my thought is exactly that like, this is part, part of how prejudice operates, is that it can kind of lock you into certain things, always being salient, no matter the task that you have. And that makes you less good at responding to that task. And that might be true for a wide variety of tasks. Yeah. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, there's one right. And then afterwards, and the back row. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I was going to suggest that bias and prejudice need to be distinguished. And that perhaps there is a pathway where you start with your attitudes, which may be biased, which presumably most of our, or perhaps all of our attitudes are biased in some way, that then may or may not go on to a prejudicial belief system. And um, so I would kind of like to distinguish between those. But also I wanted to add that I wonder whether prejudice this needs, if we're talking about a belief system, needs to have a persistence about it. Because to, it seems to me that you can have a prejudice that um, something that women are inferior to men, and then you realize through life's experience, through your personal experience, that actually that's not the case. And then you've lost that prejudice, perhaps that's maybe a bit optimistic. But, but prejudice is in the face of all the evidence, in the face of everything, you continue with these aberrant belief systems. So something about the systems and the distinction between bias and prejudice. Yeah, good, good. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that uh, there are ways in which we might want to distinguish between bias and prejudice. And, you know, it kind of comes back to an earlier question to do with definitions like, um, is our, like, to what extent is our project here partly one of kind of tracking how people use these terms and to what extent do we think they're sort of independently separate entities that underlie them? Or... So I'm also quite interested in, independently in um, the ways in which bias can have this more formal meaning where it can just sort of indicate any systematic waiting in a process, for instance, you know, um, and, and then once you're thinking of bias in those terms, you get this question, which is, when is a bias bad? And when is it just like an inevitable aspect of interpreting almost any set of information, particularly when, for instance, the hypothesis or the conclusion that you need to reach is undetermined by the evidence you're going on. In some sense, you need some kind of background beliefs, which might look a lot like biases to arrive at any determinate interpretation of what you're dealing with in, a, in the face of sort of uncertainty like that. Um, so yeah, like an independent interest of mine, I guess, is trying to figure out like, what what is bias and when is bias a bad thing and when is it something that's like a legitimate part of scientific process or just our own reasoning, our own minds. I think, I think you're right about persistence, yeah, that um, we don't want prejudice to just kind of be an incidental thing. So that's a concern that some people have raised with the way in which I'm thinking about this is like, because I'm not saying that there has to be an underlying attitude, like a belief that we can attribute to the individual in question, because it can just be constituted by what they're paying attention to. And because what they're paying attention to is determined by lots of contextual factors, not just sort of the inside of their own head, you might think, well, actually, I kind of think prejudice has to be the sort of thing that's more located inside your your own head it's a bit more kind of reified in that way there's a thing we can point to in your head and that's the prejudice so i guess there is something that's like slightly radical about my project here which is in terms of i don't think those questions aren't important but sometimes i think you know whether or not it's inside your head can be a kind of distraction just from recognizing the effect or upshot of that which is that you end up with something that looks a lot like a, a kind of prejudice but i, I think um, that is a controversial aspect of it this but yeah and um, just two behind you yes and any other questions? Any other hands up at the moment? Yeah. Okay. We can sort of work our way back down afterwards. Over to you. Yeah. It's a practical question, really. As prejudice limits the experience of people and their access to society, forms of power, it's something that could destabilize society and you know turn order into chaos. So, is there anything that can be done in terms of how we raise children and how the the curriculum in schools and universities? 
is shifted to enable people's development of, of, of methods for selection to make it more beneficial to society. And if that was possible, who would organise it and how would you know it was ethical? That's a great question. Yeah, and it's something something I'm interested in, you know, I'm kind of in the process of raising children and so it's something I kind of think about a lot. And um, for the most part, I think I'm massively impressed at how much of a better job I think their schools do at engaging with questions around kind of prejudice and discrimination than ever happened when I was at school. And I'm really impressed at how mindful they are in like, the teaching of history at the moment, including um, voices from people of colour and um, more more of a historical focus on the role of women in ways that I don't think was there when, when I was studying that stuff. So I guess like, the biggest thing I would want to encourage, and I think it's encouraging that that is coming already, is just an awareness of the choices that are being made as you design a curriculum about what you're deciding to focus everybody's attention on. So I guess this is something that concerns me too as an educator at the university that when you draw up a reading list or you give a lecture, you know, you're being highly selective in terms of the huge body of work that's out there. So I think it's important to kind of bear in mind your responsibility as somebody who's kind of zooming in on some things and, you know, putting other things to the back of the queue. So, so I think that's not always a perspective that's sort of, that's been there an awareness of the choices that you're making in terms of the selection of information. So often it can seem like, well, there's just, there is a literary canon or there is a historical canon. These are the events that mattered and this is the way we talk about them. So I think it's really helpful to have an awareness of the kind of greater choice that we have in, in that way. Thank you. Um, Graham, you might need to spring into action and get a microphone. Oh, yes, go and do a quick one and then we'll come back down. All right. Um, the question I've got is, um, Richard is generally speaking is fairly negative word yeah um if you look at the world of diagnostics in whatever field you're in that you are guided by prejudice really to set up the right diagnosis because you can't go through all the possible options that are available to you you, know, you, just, you know you never get to the conclusion so in that sense prejudice becomes quite a positive thing and becomes a learned behavior. Um, how, how would you call that prejudice or is that something else? Because the two, to me, don't line up. Yeah, good. So, so I guess this is kind of coming back to a, a previous question about the relationship between bias and prejudice as well. So maybe that's a case where I might call that a bias whilst allowing that some biases can be neutral or potentially even positive. So the kind of diagnostic case you give, I think, is really helpful. Like, um, what's that phrase that people use? Like, if you hear hooves, think horses, you know, rather than unicorns or whatever. So the idea being, like, it, often things are just caused by the most probable explanation, and that's enshrined in certain principles of Bayesian inference or something that, you know, en encourage you to interpret new information in the light of what you've learned in the past. So then the question becomes like, yeah, do we recognize that as a form of prejudice or is that just learning from past experience? When does one become the other? I think for me, I would think that prejudice is always a bit more negatively valenced. And so then the question is, when does that kind of reasoning become a problem? What's the point at which you think that's not legitimately just drawing on past experience? That's, you know, not having an open enough mind to alternative possibilities in this particular case or something. Or, um, and so some of my other work, I guess, looks at um, other kinds of epistemic problem that might arise that might help us distinguish the kind of legitimate cases of drawing on past experience from something which looks more like a problematic over-reliance on certain priors, for instance. Um, yeah, Graham, I think uh, a couple of areas ahead, yes. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. I've learned a lot from that. Um, I, the short version of my question is, uh, it starts with that um, prejudice or prejudging is necessary in order to live in the world. Uh, and then the question is, what's wrong with prejudice? What's wrong with prejudice? So to live in the world, I think it was well, I think it was by Kahneman, um, thinking fast and slow. Kahneman, uh, yeah. And, and most of the time we think fast because we just use hunches, uh, which in a sense is prejudging. And we wouldn't be able to operate without that. So in that sense, it's gone out of prejudice. It's a good thing. So the question is, 
in what sense is prejudice a bad thing? And what you said, it sounds to me that she thinks it's a bad thing because it's inefficient. Um, if, if there's a bias in it, or you're doing it the wrong way, you're going to come to an inefficient solution rather than it being unfair or offensive, which is the other negative of prejudice. Is, is that where you stand? You think it's an inefficient? I'm sorry, I definitely think it's also unfair and offensive and you know, I'm, I, yeah, yeah. but I'm happy to sort of hand that part of the task over to my colleagues who work more on moral philosophy, for instance, and sort of my, my expertise is as an epistemologist. So, yeah, so I guess my, my hunch is that the point at which we cross over from something that looks like efficiently learning from past experience into the kind of thing that we want to recognise as prejudice is the point at which we've got this loss of flexibility in, in some way or other. Now, how much flexibility you want is really context dependent. It's going to depend on the particular task that you have and the particular stakes in play. So one thing I think is interesting is that perhaps we feel differently about cases that involve thinking about other people than just thinking about objects in the world, right? And there it can seem particularly important to keep an open mind or to not just interpret somebody in light of what they've done in the past or in light of what people like them have done in the past. And so perhaps that's for moral reasons. One thing that I've also been interested from more in from a more epistemic point of view is that I think it's helpful to notice that we have different epistemic projects. And one of them is like learning about how this world actually is. So then there's another one, which is like learning about how the world could be. So I kind of call that modal epistemology, a term philosophers use to talk about kind of possibility. And, and sometimes I think those two can be intention. So sometimes it might be that we want to rely less heavily on our priors because we're not just interested in learning about how the world actually is, but also in other ways that it could be, because that's really relevant for a range of other projects that we might have. So, um, yeah, so for me, I think it's inefficiency, maybe like I think flexibility is key, but yeah, that is going to then contribute exactly to efficient problem solving in a range of ways. And I think a range of ways that are really pertinent to what it is to be a kind of good epistemic agent, a good reasoner, a good knower in certain mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. Um, I think we had one, yes, um, a couple, a few rows ahead. Yes. I had a question that's related to everything, the question that's been raised. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bringing it all together, great. Yeah, well, I wanted to get to the further applications, because I feel oh, yeah. like that actually kind of answered some of the questions, especially with the education one. Uh -huh. with going forward, if prejudice is an umbrella term, uh -huh. lots of things like other things like love, for example, and who is um, the person who's, who's supposed to all like the organizations are going to tell us how to deal with it when it comes to the negative parts. Prejudice could be a structure, and if we take out the pillars of the bit that make it the salient structure, which I find this fascinating because it makes you think. And I think once you start thinking, you can think of this prejudice to be positive or negative because it's helpful at some point. So if you can talk to us about the jokes, and if I just, for example, rolled uh, the Roald Dahl conversation about rewriting his books or or that there's a huge conversation about that. So I think that kind of leads us to your point itself of talking about. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. It's funny actually. Um, like I had a conversation about the World Dark case with my mum, and I think she felt like it was kind of overkill to be writing his books. And then I had to reveal that actually we'd been like missing bits out when we were reading them for a long time, just to like so in um George's Marvelous Medicine, the ways in which the grandmother is described, like when you read them, you're like, oh my God, it's so misogynistic. Like the word hag is used a lot and like, this is real. And he really encourages a kind of body horror. And actually while I'm naming and shaming children's authors, like um, David Williams, like some of the ways in which he talks about women's bodies, I'm just like, oh man, like I, I feel deeply uncomfortable with it. So um question then is like yeah like so why is that a problem and like how does this help us understand it so my thought is like sometimes it really matters how salient information is to you whether or not you're like endorsing a particular claim or something so the stuff about jokes and questions is like these are ways in which in conversation people can introduce some content and then back off from actually endorsing it right so they can be like i'm not saying it is a problem i'm just like asking the question like you know put in whatever question you want to put there or like 
Similarly, if you think of comedians who've uh, got a lot of flack for some of their controversial material, it's tempting to back off from that and just be like, it's just a joke. Right? Can't you take, you know, it's just a joke. Like, and what people are saying when they're saying that is like, look, I'm not sincerely asserting this. I'm not saying it's true, but there's still like a very significant thing that's happening when you're doing that, which is like you're raising the salience of it in the kind of both within like the local conversation you're having there, but also kind of culturally within like more kind of cultural conversation. So yeah, I, I do think when it comes to children's books, like there's some stuff that it's not like I think my kid is going to acquire some explicit set of beliefs, but there are going to be terms to that he, that, that he might be at the forefront of his mind when it came to referring to women, or there might be like ways of viewing a body that focus on like weight or, you know, um, other aspects of it that are not what I kind of want to be at the the forefront of his mind. So, so that, that's what I had in mind when I was sort of talking about that application. Does that speak to what you were interested in? Yeah, yeah we related to something I, I wanted to ask actually, which is there's a lot of debate often amongst journalists about whether statements are racist or institutions are racist or prejudiced. And, that seems to factor into well, your explanation gives a good account of that, doesn't it? Does the does the statement give undue salience to an irrelevant, or does the institution, like a, in the post office case, famously they were noting down the so-called racial characteristics of the sub postmasters in the files. So clearly, if an institution does that sort of thing as a practice, that's undue salience. But you could say also in David Williams or or, or whatever it is, the um, the undue savings given something I think is likely to express prejudice or encourage prejudice or cause prejudice. How, how does your account fit with those cases? Um, yeah, that postmaster case is, is is a really interesting example of it. So, um, what was it you said two beats before that? About oh, journalism. journalism. So I feel like this is a conversation, yeah, exactly, that's like super relevant to journalism. And there are philosophers, Susanna Siegel has like worked particularly on kind of the philosophy of journalism. Because journalists are always making this decision, which is like, what should we put on, you know, the front page or the first bit of the website? Or like, lots of people aren't going to go very much beyond that. Um, and so that's like a, a, a big decision in terms of how we kind of shape conversations and what information we're saying matters. So it's not just about like, are the claims in your story true, but also what questions do we think should be uppermost in people's minds and i think another good example of this is um so the office for national statistics has a branch which is has to oversee sort of whether people in public life are using statistics responsibly yes. and now this is a huge question it's like what counts as responsible use of statistics and there's like an easy question which is like well is the statistic true or accurate and even that's not that easy because there's lots of ways of interpreting a statistic and lots of different bodies of evidence you could be drawing on but then in terms of whether or not it's responsibly used there you have to think about the broader communicative context and what you're making salient by you know employing one statistic rather than another um so that's clearly a kind of a dimension that you want to be in play there i think the thing which is really tricky and which is a philosopher i'm less clear what like it's like how do we operationalize the standard in play here or like in the case of statistics when is it legitimate to use a statistic you know, actually, the statistic itself might be entirely commonplace. It might be a completely unremarkable crime statistic about a particular group. But if you read just a statistic about crime, it's going to raise in your mind the salience of that group is associated with crime in some way. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how you operationalize that into some kind of standard where you say that's legit and that's not legit. Mm. Um, yeah. um, I think we have a couple of fun. Graham, do you want to um, pass over? And then I think you had a question, Graham, which might have earned the right to ask up to your <laughs> energy there. I'm really impressed with your uh, lecture. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I was wondering whether you looked into the situation where somebody is impossible to discuss anything with. They're so <laughs> stuck with their prejudice and you provide them with evidence that they're incorrect they will not even consider it. Have you looked at that sort of kind of obstinacy of those sort of people and why they're like that? Yeah, so I think that's really interesting. And actually, I think there's like lots of work in philosophy at the moment that sort of might speak to that in some way. So somebody who's completely obstinate is going to have, there's going to be sort of a whole range of problems with them. 
epistemically. So if you're presenting them with new evidence and they're not responding to that evidence, that seems like a kind of a good starting place in terms of that being a problem. But I think it's really interesting how it can also be um, worthwhile sort of understanding how that could come about. And one reason that might come about is if you have some sort of you could think of it like a hyper trial or something where you are so strongly weighting one particular source of evidence that anything that contradicts it, instead of um, instead of reappraising your belief, you're going to reappraise how reliable that source of evidence is. And actually, we probably all do this to some degree. So, like, if I meet somebody, um, i trying to think of an uncontroversial example that I can use here. There are some beliefs so extreme that if I meet somebody who has them, I'm probably going to downgrade how much trust I put in them more generally. But in a way, that serves to insulate me from the counter evidence they might be offering me. Um, and so I think we all need to be a bit wary of that, that we can end up with these beliefs, which are almost impenetrable to counter evidence, because you're thinking you're using it itself as a standard by which you decide whether a source is reliable or not. On the other hand, maybe sometimes we do need to have those kinds of yardsticks, like we need ways of assessing how reliable and you know interlocutor is and, and, and what we should say to them. Um, so, so I think like sort of standard epistemology has all sorts of things that it can say that are that it that's interesting there. I suppose like maybe what I have more resources to deal with are people who are not necessarily insensitive to what you're saying, but they just nonetheless kind of the the thing that still looms large in their mind is the is one particular view or something or you know you might be saying like yeah i'm not saying that's not true but there's all this other stuff to consider as well and that might be the thing that they're, they're really struggling with um, yeah thank you and uh graham robin you're not waving your hand at me for once okay good all right that was you graham <laughs> someone else okay cool um one of the things I love about philosophy is the ability to zoom in or out of the subject. Um, you talked about uh, prejudice, which in the, the modern world does have a moral dimension. And I'm curious about that in the sense of the survivability of humans in general, to really, really zoom out and to unpack that in, in that sense. Um, one of the things when I was very little that my granddad used to tell me was, like him or hate him, we needed an arsehole to win the Second World War, regardless of the evidence to suggest that whatever. Um, it, it's one of those things where, you know, Winston Churchill is kind of talked about as a bad person, but in the same breath, he's also talked about as a powerful, strong person that we needed mm. at the time. And he had his prejudices, but he also had a bit of frozen in front and blah, 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 blah. Um, so that comes down to this matter of biodiversity. Uh, in ecology, a system is as strong as its biodiversity. Uh, a rainforest is an extremely strong ecosystem because it has many, many different parameters and contexts, and every single point of view is expressed in a sort of natural balance. Whereas monocultures are very weak ecological systems because they're monocultures. They have one way of doing things, and that's it. So in that framework is prejudice actually a good or a bad thing when you consider the biodiversity of the human species as a whole is it something that actually empowers us to consider each other in different ways or is it something that is like if, if we dissuade ourselves from prejudice are we essentially turning ourselves into a monoculture that's really interesting because i guess i thought of it more like this ways in which prejudice is the pressure that turns us into a monoculture rather than um, a kind of manifestation of social biodiversity in some ways. So, um, yeah, so how would we decide between those two? Or what is it that's making me think that it's this kind of pressure towards towards a monoculture? Um, internal versus external causes, potentially. Yeah, so... so so I guess that, um, so, okay, so take the particular cases that I've been talking about. My sense of what's happening there is like prejudice is this force that's kind of um, locking you into one particular way of thinking or one particular way of viewing the world insofar as, you know, you have this kind of calcification in your, in your salient structure. And so what it would be to be unprejudiced would be to be capable of this more kind of um, radically flexible form of attention in the world or maybe in our in our thought more generally. So like 
another of the applications I was going to talk about if I had time is thinking about like search engines and what we want from a from a search engine. Um, and so one of the senses I have there again is that we want search engines to be able to um, kind of be, be highly flexible in terms of what information they're giving us. And some of the ways in which I think search engines might look like they're kind of prejudiced is when they're producing a kind of monolithic stream of information in response to any inquiry. And, um, or like, for instance, when you get this, uh, you, you know, you can have like ways in which information on the internet can become organized around um, sex, for instance, like that could be like a very dominant category when it comes to its, its organization. You have to kind of be aware of that when you're searching on search engines. And so that can be a way in which you can feel like you've got this kind of loss of diversity, I guess, in your informational ecosystem rather, rather than a boost to it. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's how I've been thinking about it. I mean, I guess part of this is going to come down to whether we're using this term prejudice in a way that's always negatively valenced along some dimension or other. Or, or not. Um, so it may be that there are kind of micro or more localized biases that are kind of helpful. Um, but I guess once it's reached a point where we're kind of describing it as a prejudice, I would be skeptical that it's going to be contributing to that sort of diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end, actually. So I think what I'll do at this point is just mention our next speaker. Um, we have Professor Lisa Bortolotti. Oh, yeah, that, that's going to be great. I, hope, I wish I could interview her. We can. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in a way, I think she's going to be picking up on some connected themes. She's going to be talking about not just prejudice, uh, but delusions, which is uh, her, her specialist subject. She's the editor in chief of philosophical psychology, and she'll be asking why do people adopt delusional beliefs? And why can they, I noticed she said they, not we, uh, <laughs> you, you share her confidence, uh, be, be so reluctant to part with them. So I think it's, it's going to be a really interesting development and connection with what we've been hearing tonight. Um, so I would like to say uh, a couple of thank yous, one to my two lovely assistants tonight, uh, Graham and Robin. And Jenny, who was over at the back, who um, was able to help you. A uh, big thank you to everyone for coming along. Another capacity crowd. I think you all found it interesting, uh, judging by the questions. And a huge thank you, finally, to Jesse for joining us. Thank you very much.